Luke chapter 24, and uh, I just want to tell a story a little bit before we start. Tina and I were, uh, uh, the reason I love children's ministry is because every church we were, uh, we first became Christians, every church we got involved in, we did children's ministry. And sometimes we had zero funds, sometimes we had a lot of funds, but most of our, and we had a lot of fun in children's ministry all the time. And we would uh, love teaching them to kids. Uh, we have different uh, object lessons, and we have one like this, we'd say, Okay, what is, and I remember, uh, and I just picked the name off because I couldn't remember the little boy's name, so I could name him Sam today. We used to have a little boy named Sam who was in North Carolina, and every time we'd ask a question, no matter what the question was, he would yell, the answer is Jesus. And so whatever it was, whatever it was, the lesson was, or whatever, you know, reading, or whatever time we had, he would always yell out, okay, what's the answer? He wouldn't even, he wouldn't wait to raise, he would raise his hand, but then he'd just shout out the answer because he was so excited to be in children, because we would give out candy. Every time they get an answer, right? So people would want the candy. So no matter what, they knew that Jesus was like the answer, that they would get candy. And so Sam would just roll, raise his hand and yell out the answer, candy. And so if we'd give an object lesson like this, we'd say, well, this is the light, the light doesn't work, right? But if we plug it into a power source, the light would work. You see, does that work? Um, and we'd say, what, what is the power source? And he would say, Jesus. Jesus, right, and so we was, it, it was really fun, so I was using the last I had a drill one time, I plugged it into the wall, and the drill would go, and they would say Jesus, and he would always just raise his hand, and then, of course, we'd always give him candy, because I think I like candy more than the kids did, but anyway, um, I, I just think, yeah, then we'd send them home, which was kind of fun, too, the parents <laughs> would just get mad at us all the time, don't ever give my kids candy, and, you know, I'm, I mean, being in a church setting, you know, you're, Jesus has given grace to everybody, so I think he gave grace to me through the parents, you know, and I said, well, if this person got a candy and this kid didn't, then how can I do that? I just couldn't do that. So everybody got a handful of candy as they left the door every time in the children's ministry. Uh, that was our biggest budget item, was, was candy. But anyway, Sam would always hand, raise his hand. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And we're going to talk about that today because I believe in my heart of hearts that Jesus is really the answer for every question that we have, right? And it's, it, it is, it really is. And, and I just wanted to, uh, we'll talk about that today, how Jesus uh, revealed himself to disciples and how he um, preached who he was. When Jesus came on earth, he said, when he started preaching his preaching ministry, or after he was baptized and after the Holy Spirit said it on him, he said, I, I'm preaching, he said, I'm preaching the kingdom of God. The gospel of the kingdom of God. Or he also said that, um, uh, that he, he's preaching the kingdom is now. He'd always preach that to, to the disciples, to the Jewish people. He said, this is what the, he's starting with preaching on. The kingdom of God is now. Or the gospel of the kingdom of God is now. So I thought, what does that mean? Jesus was preaching to everyone when he first came. He said, the kingdom of God is now. Man, does that mean the kingdom of God is like in the world right now? What does, that, what does that mean? What does, what does it mean that the gospel, that Jesus preached the gospel? Well, the gospel is Jesus. That's what we're supposed to preach. But Jesus was preaching the gospel. So what was he preaching? So I want to talk about that today. Let's look at uh, uh, Matthew, or Luke 24. And this was after Jesus' resurrection. Luke 24. And in my Bible, it has a little break in it. It talks about the resurrection on, on, on chapter uh, 24, verse 1. Then it talks on, uh, to this, uh, on the road to Emmaus. <coughs> is the next one. It says in verse 13. So we're going to start there. Actually, Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Hmm. But anyway, let's look at this. Um, Luke 24, 1, uh, 13. It says, now that same day, two of them were going to the village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were walk, uh, talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked, walked alongside them, but they did not, uh, but they were kept from recognizing him. So he was there, he was a person walking with them, but he, they didn't recognize him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood uh, still, their faces downcast. One of them, called Cle uh, Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who did not know the things that had happened um, uh, there in these days? What things, he asked. As, Je as Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, He was a prophet, a powerful in words and deeds, 
before God and all of the people. The chief priests and all uh, and our rulers handed him over to set, be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he would uh, was the one who would, was going to restore or redeem Israel. And what is more, what and, and what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition to some of the, our women were amazed. They went to the tomb early in the morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told him that they would seen a vision of an angel who said to him that he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but, uh, but him they did not see. He said to them, How foolish are you, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Did not Christ have to suffer these things and then enter uh, his glory? And then he began to share with them. And he began with, from Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And you go on to read that he said it was a, the law of the prophets, the Psalms, uh, Moses, the, the Psalms, the prophets. And so Jesus began to explain all these things. So I want to tell you for a moment, what did Jesus say about himself? What did Jesus say about himself? Because he began to explain from Moses, the Psalms, and the prophets. He began to explain to them. He fulfilled all the things. So I, I took a little of my liberty to say, I'm going to go and share with you this morning maybe some of the things that Jesus shared. Amen? What did Jesus share with them? And so let's, I think if you go back to Genesis, we're going to go through a couple different scriptures here. If you go back to Genesis chapter 3, remember when the fall of man, when and when Adam and Eve were deceived in the garden, the devil, uh, the snake said, did God really say these things? And then the uh, man and woman, uh, the Adam and Eve, were cast out of the garden, and there's an angel put there, and they could no longer go back in the garden, right? And then look what it says in verse chapter 3, verse 16. It's like my favorite little Genesis story. It says, he will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. So, this is the, let me read the whole thing. It says, cursed are you above all livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly. Let's talk about the snake. You'll eat the dust and all the days of your life. Verse 15, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head. Who's that? Who's he here? We look at John 13, 18. He is Jesus. He will crush your head, talking to the snake, and you will strike his heel. So the victory that, Jesus, that Satan thought he won was what? On the cross. Hey, I put him on the cross. He's crucified. He was, he was going to die. He was, his, it was over. In their minds, I believe they, he thought he won at that moment. It was a dark day. Darkness came over a whole earth, right? And I think Jesus was telling those two on the road to Emmaus, listen, at this story right here, this was me. Satan thought he was going to win, but I won. Right? I, I, I died on the cross. I suffered all those things. And my blood was shed for you. And we'll talk about that in a second. And, and I, I was the one that had, I was going to be the one to have victory over death, hell, and the grave. And this is the first story. I think he revealed that to them. And they went, hmm. Okay, maybe I understand that. I'm not really sure. Jesus goes on a little more. He went to Exodus. I think he said, it, you know, they didn't have the New Testament right now, right? They didn't have that. They just went, there was a book of the law that they were, that Jesus was revealing all this stuff. Some people say that every verse, every chapter, every line uh, reveals Jesus. I'm like, well, I don't really think that, but I think every story does. Every concept reveals Jesus, amen. I think he's in here everywhere because even he's called sometimes the angel of the Lord. But look at Genesis or Exodus chapter 12. This was the Passover. Do you remember the story of the Passover, right? There were, the children of Israel were in Egypt. They were slaves. They, were, they had a word. They were being uh, 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 treated horribly. Moses was called by God to go there to get his people out of Egypt. And all those plagues happened, all that stuff happened, right? Then at the end, when they Pharaoh finally refused again and again and again, rejected Moses' request to let the people go and worship, and then God said, this isn't happening. I want you to take a land. 
I want you to go look at verse chapter 12. It says, uh, to tell Moses to tell the whole community this, and then each, each household was to take, was to take a lamb. And that lamb, look at verse uh, uh, 4, if any household is too, uh, let's see, verse 3, tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of the month, each man should take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people uh, that are there. You are to determine the amount of the lamb needed to be according to the to what each person will eat. The animal you choose must be, look at this verse 5, the animal that you choose must be a year old male without defect. I think Jesus told those guys on the road of man that listen, I was the lamb. I was, I was, I'm, I was the one, I came, I came, I was in heaven, I was with the Father, and the Father commanded me to go down to earth to, to redeem all of mankind, and he said, I was perfect in my humanity. That's the word God said, he knew no sin. He knew no sin, he was perfect. And they took that lamp, and they, they sacrificed it the way they were supposed to. They prepared it. Everybody was supposed to partake of that. They were supposed to be ready. They were supposed to have their garments ready. They were supposed to have their cloak on, if they said, their outer garments, ready to go to travel. And I think that's a type for us today, right? If we know that Jesus Christ is our, our Savior, we're supposed to be ready. We're supposed to be ready for a journey. We're just temporary. This, 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 um, this life that we live on this earth right now is just temporal. Amen? And, we're, and I like the part where it talks about if you have too much, go get your neighbor. I love that part. Bring your neighbor with you and, and prepare for them and, and take them with you, right? So on your journey. And I like that because I like all my neighbors around me, so I want to see them come to see Jesus too. Amen? I want them to know him. And so I think Jesus was telling the, 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 the guys on, on, the, on, the, on the road uh, that he was that sacrificial lamb. That his blood, this Jesus that, that they sacrificed, was a, that his blood was a shed for, for all humanity, all the sins of all humanity. So anything we've ever done, God can forgive us because it's a perfect sacrifice. We knew that, right? Everybody here knows that. And he, and he was telling them that story. They didn't, they didn't connect the dots. They, they know these stories. They know them. They, most young Jewish men, they know these stories from their birth. I mean, and ladies, they knew they know this. They know these stories, but they never connected out. This was Jesus, but Jesus was revealing Himself to us, to um, reveal, revealing Himself to them. He was a sacrificial lamb. He was a Passover. He was a perfect sacrifice. And then they said, "Take some of the blood and dip it in hyssop and put it on the doorpost." Do you remember the story, right? So he said they take it and put it on the, the doorpost, on the top, right, and on the sides. On both sides, actually, right? So I was like, what does that represent? It's a covering over us, right? And when the death angel came to that area, he saw the blood, and no harm came to that family. Only the Egyptian family suffered. Their firstborn was, was uh, taken from them. So that covering, that blood covers us. How many would agree that that blood still covers us today? Amen. That cup, that blood that they were using back then represented Jesus' blood that was shed for our sins, and that we're covered. And you put that blood, if you can physically just do that, and, and like put a covering over you, and realize that God is covering us, and that death, hell, the grave, the enemy, all those things that might come attack us, but we're covered by it. Because Jesus says Jesus was tempted in every way, and he knew no sin. We get tempted in every way, and we know sin, right? <laughs> we make mistakes, but we say, no, I am covered by the blood. I think he told them uh, on the road, he says, listen, all that blood that was shed, that Jesus that was sacrificed just a couple days earlier, well, that blood was covered uh, us today. Amen? And then, I think, he, to prove that fact, I think he went over to Psalms. Turn over to Psalms for me, in, in uh, Psalms 22. It said, this Jesus, David wrote this psalm. David wrote about the suffering that was going to happen. 
and even recorded the words that Jesus was going to say when he was on the cross. So some of them witnessed that. They weren't all hiding. They witnessed his, his suffering. They, some of them actually saw him die on the cross. And I think some of them actually heard these words. And I'm thinking, just because of the situation uh, and the road that they, they were pondering all these things, I think they, were, they probably were there too. And he said this. He went to Psalms. That's my, my version of it. Jesus said, this is me. You remember this, what David wrote? He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken? Jesus was going to say that, and he did. It was recorded earlier. I think their eyes began to open up a little bit. There's something about this person sharing this with us, right? And he began to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken? Why are you so far from me, from saving me? So far from my words. Just read this. I can't hardly read this and think about what Jesus on the cross, dying and suffering, all that pain, all the stuff that he went through, and he did that for you. And Jesus preached this. That's why people didn't understand it. He's saying that the, today the kingdom of God is at hand. This today, I'm going to reveal to you. And that's why it was so, they were so messed up. If you go back and read the, any, Matthew or Mark or Luke, any of the Gospels, and you're going to see how Jesus was teaching certain things. He says, if, if you hate somebody, it's evil to murder. Well, they can deal with hatred because in the, in the Old Testament it says hatred is you know, punishment for that. But they says, then if you... If you just dislike somebody, it's like murder. Oh my goodness, it just blew their minds all the time. Everything you just you said, he, uh, heal the sick. You have, you know, certain procedures you had if you, in the Old Testament, you look at Leviticus, or, or um, yeah, Leviticus, and it tells you, okay, if you have this kind of disease, this is a, the procedures you need to do to try to overcome that disease. It's kind of crazy. You know, if you have a boil, this is what you're supposed to I mean, it's very specific. And then Jesus would not just reach out and touch and heal the person. It's amazing, right? It's amazing. Look at Luke, um, Luke chapter 4. The answer is, is Jesus. And I, he began to share, um, I think this part of scripture, it says, in Luke chapter 4, it said that, in verse 15, or verse 18, he said, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery to sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the good year of the Lord. Now put your finger there and go over to Isaiah 61. Right? 
even some Roman people came to Jesus. We see the Roman sincerity of saying, oh, I, I, I do, what you do, would you heal my, my servant? Don't, matter of fact, the Roman centurion said, don't, don't even go to my, their house, just say the word, and my servant will be healed. He had so, so much faith. I mean, the Romans, people that were rulers over Jerusalem, they even believed. The only people that didn't believe and rejected it was the religious people because they thought they were losing some authority. Those people are actually worshiping God. Jesus was actually teaching that. So when we look at um, when when Jesus was doing his ministry, even he said to John, when John was in prison before he was beheaded, he says, Tell John this the blind are seeing, the deaf are hearing. This is happening, this is fulfilling the scriptures. Amen. So why did I say all that? Because we need to have faith as a group here that Jesus really is the answer for all. What we do. Amen. Jesus is the answer for every aspect of our life. Every, every trouble, every trial, every disappointment, everything we do, we have to know that Jesus can fulfill all that. Amen. He can do that for us if we trust. I, this is my prayer. Lord, help my um, <laughs> Lord, help me to believe that you are the answer. This is my whole week. That's all I think about. So I'm going to tell you guys today, I was thinking this week, I'm going to tell you today that you have to trust Jesus. Not in ourselves. Not in our capability. Not in our intelligence. Not in what we can handle in our situation. Because sometimes we just fail at that anyway. But in everything, we need to trust Jesus. Well, this, that's really simple, Pastor Bob. Yeah. It is real simple. How do we trust him? Well, let's do what he said. Let's reveal to the world who he really is. That Jesus be glorified in our lives and nothing else. So I think, is Jesus Lord over every aspect of my life? Don't answer that question, but right now. But is Jesus Lord over my life? Am I being Jesus to my wife? Am I, am I being Jesus to my husband? Am I being Jesus to my children? Am I being Jesus at work? Am I being Jesus? I mean, so I, I just had a thought. Are we, um, are, are we going uh, back to being closet Christians and not really being Christians out in the open? Are we trusting each other? Can we share Jesus with it? I like what Andy does in the first couple of weeks we've just been doing this. We're changing our format a little bit. But, you know, in the beginning of our service, we said, anybody have a testimony? Because we've got to say anything or do anything. Why? Because 1 Corinthians 14 tells us that when we come together, we should have a song or a hymn or a testimony or a prophet, a, a word from the Lord, a prophecy. And so... I think that's the way church should be, right? So can we do that here? Can we allow that to happen? Well, that's not the church I'm used to. The church I'm used to is I come in, I'm told what to do, and then I go home. Right? Or we might say a few something. But it did change it. When we're really the body of Christ, we're saying, we're, we as a, a group here, we want to change a little bit. So can we come together as a small group like this and actually just share with each other what God's doing? Right? Because God is doing something in your life every day if we let him. Amen? Don't, go, don't look mad at me or anything, okay? I just I love you. But it's true. Because it takes a moment. I know a teenager, we're going through some stuff. And so it's like, do we trust Jesus? Right? Do we trust God? Well, yeah, we do. No, do you really trust God? I'm getting frustrated or mad over the situation, right? So... So why am I getting mad? So I said, why am I getting mad about this? Because I'm not in control. That's, men do that, I do that. So I'm not, I'm, I'm not in control of this situation. So I, don't, I don't allow God to be Lord over that situation. So Tina says to me, do you trust God? And I get mad. Of course I trust God. But I don't want to hear it from her, right? I mean, I know, all right? I don't want to hear it from somebody because now I have to act on it. Like, I really have to believe I trust God because I look her in the eye and say, yes, I trust God. I don't know who does that here. But, um, so, I, you know, and then Tino, when Tino have her moments where she is, is struggling with things, and I'll say, honey, the gospel says, do you trust God? 
you we could have lowered over the situation and she'll get mad for a moment. Not the teen girl mad. But and then she'll say, Yes, I trust God. <laughs> right? Because we know we you don't want to go there because you know you don't want to say something that's true. Because at that moment we speak truth to each other. At that moment we're we're defeating the enemy. We're crushing him, right? And we're saying, no, we trust Jesus at that moment. And it's really good when we can do it together, right? So we want to just, we want you guys to do that here as a whole, right? As we do that together, do we, Glenn, do you trust God in that situation? Right? Yes, I do. Now, can you walk in it? I don't know. I need your help, <laughs> right? And we do, and we need each other's help to trust God in every situation in our life. Because that's what Jesus revealed to himself. He said, preach the gospel. He said, I, he says that, um, that he himself was saying to the people back then, he says, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. He said that to Jewish people. They knew the law. They knew the Old, all the, all the, all the Old Testament. They knew the prophet. They knew all the stuff. He says, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. I think the message is still today the same way. Like, repent. I have to repent when I don't believe. Because I know the kingdom of God is greater than this kingdom right here. And I know there's life in the kingdom of God. I know there's joy in the kingdom of God. I know there's peace in the kingdom of God. I know there's all those things, and I need to be able to walk in that. Amen? And so I trust. So I have to tell to you, do you trust God? Or most of the time, she tells me, I just, you know. Do you trust God? Finance, and sometimes not so much. Relationships, differently, you know? Waiting for a job? Do I trust God? You know, do I trust God? Is, is, can God heal my marriage? Can God uh, get me another? I mean, I don't know so much about everybody, so I don't want to say anything. But just do I trust God? And I would say, yes. Do I trust God for Amy's healing? So I, it was interesting because when Amy was just a little, little girl, can I tell the story? Is that okay? I'm going to start going. Um, <laughs> but there was a time, and I was just thinking about this yesterday because Amy, Amy and Jesus went to the uh, was Amy, uh, Jesus' birthday, Esther's birthday, yesterday party, and so Amy wound up in the hospital yesterday again in the morning for six, seven hours. And 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 so when Amy was just a little girl, uh, we uh, she had this. We, she was born with a hemangioma, which is in a lymph node uh, angioma that uh, that is in her neck area, in her butt, base, or top. It doesn't affect her airway, hasn't yet anyway, but it's that. Big. And we went to a, a Benihim crusade, actually, in a, a dream after she had, and God healed her. She had this golf ball size uh, tumor like thing on the side of her neck, and God just took it away. I mean, just instant, it was gone. Like, before my hands, uh, she, it was just melting in my hands. It was just amazing. And we trust God. So, all these years later, now, I mean, you know, all these years later, now she's dealing with this kind of the same thing. And so I was thinking, well, God, you've healed that. You know, why, don't, why is she dealing with this again? I don't know why. But I do still believe that she's healed. Right? I have to not doubt what I see, but believe that God will continue to heal. Amen? And God does heal. So, I mean, we've seen that here so many times. This, this is crazy. So we just believe that what God's Word says, the Gospel says that we are healed. So we believe that he's healed. So we just pray. And I tell people, I, I got this from Pastor Mike Robertson, and when I, I just pray and believe. And if it happens, God gets all the glory. If it doesn't happen, God still gets all the glory. But he's still God. Amen. Is that true? Right. Come on. Yeah. God gets all the glory no matter what happens. So we need to trust him and all these things. So I guess what I'm gonna say today, just like little Sam. And Sunday school class. He raised his hands. Maybe before we even got the question out, he would answer, Jesus. The reward is great even for us. Amen? There's, there's a destination, there's heaven, there's so much God will give for us. So it's more just a piece of candy that he was waiting for to get because he knew that the answer somehow would be Jesus. I want to submit to your thinking today. The answer is always Jesus. The answer is always Jesus. No matter what we struggle through, no matter what life throws at you, the answer is Jesus. Because He is the only one who has the gift of eternal life. He is the only one who can have hope in. He's the only one that brings peace and joy and happiness.
happiness in our lives. He's the only one, even though through the hardest times that you go through, we can trust and rely on him. So well, that's so easy, Pastor Bob. It is. Paul said this way, he says that for what we proclaim is not of ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as servants only to Jesus. Paul's saying only that Jesus Christ will be glorified in our lives. Amen? That Jesus be glorified in your heart. That Jesus would be there in your, your workplace, in your home, in your backyard, and wherever you go, Jesus is there. And he wants to be Lord of your life. We're going to um, take communion today. And um, Andy, would you come and help me with that? And Tina, would you grab that too? And uh, we're going to serve you communion. And what, what I want to do today is when Jesus and Paul described this, when Jesus took the, the, the cup uh, before he died, he said the Jews, he, uh, the great Jews are going to have wine, or not wine, but juice, but he had a glass of wine. Or, and he, he blessed, he said, this is the, the, the uh, new covenant. So we're no longer we under the law, but we're under a new covenant because now His blood was shed for us, and all the things that were hidden in the Old Testament now revealed to us. Because we don't have, we don't have to be. What a, there's no mystery in these stories any longer. We know who it is. We know it's Jesus. Amen. He revealed Himself. He broke the bread. And he said, "This bread was broken. It is, it is my body that was broken for you. This, my, I'm going I'm to suffer. I'm going to die. I'm going to be whipped. I'm going to be spit upon. I'm going to have a crown of thorns smashed on my head. I'm going to have my beard pulled out of my face." And all that's going to happen, be broken, so you won't have to suffer. And we can talk about all that, what happened to the beard, what it meant when the crown of thorns was smashed on his head, how you're, through your thinking now, his blood was shed, so now we don't have to have, I call it stinking thinking, you know, we are now children of God. Amen? We, are, we, we know that that was our mind to be clear and understand the word things of God because of that. And the stripes that were born on his back, his body was broken and beaten, his skin ripped off his his, his, his body was because we have, as, as Isaiah tells us, that we are healed because of that. I think that's pretty cool. I thank the Lord for that. And his blood now ushers in the new covenant that we yes, all we have to do is believe and we can be forgiven. So as we are looking at this, I want you guys to get together in small groups, maybe you four back there, and these four right here, and you four right there. And maybe ask each other. And let's go ahead. Go ahead. You can move the chair, whatever. Go ahead. TT, why don't you go there with Jason? Candy, you guys go back there with that. You would that be a group, and this would be a group here. And then you guys right here, maybe Reggie, maybe you come up here with these guys. And um, why don't you just ask each other what, what in our lives? What part of our life is Jesus not Lord over? Confession is good, right? We have forgiveness, we can fast, we have healing, we can fast. There's so much that we can fast. Ask the Lord. It takes a second just to get this little wrapper open. So let's, did you ever get that open? It's really a pain sometimes. But as soon as we finish eating all these up, we'll uh, get new stuff. But for now, that's what we have. So why don't we do that? We'll say... I need Jesus to be Lord over this part of my life. This is the part of life I, I'm struggling with. And then would you just, uh, you know, and then we'll take communion, all right? So let's say, say like Amy would say, I, I'm, I'm struggling with being a good dad, or whatever, and I need help with that. And then, then take your, you know, when, they, when you say that, then you are going to take your, your, your communion. Let's take a few minutes. We're no rush. Thank you, Jesus. 
Hallelujah. Father, I just um, lift up our church family to you today. And I just thank you that, Lord, I, I pray in every area of our lives we just, our unbelief will turn into belief. Yeah. Hallelujah. Every part of our hearts and our minds and our thought pattern, Lord God, I, we just give it over to you, Lord. You be Lord over all, Lord God, over, Lord, over our hearts, our minds, and our souls. Father, over every situation that we come across this week, God, we, we just, like Sammy, Lord God, we just lift up our hands and say, Jesus, Jesus is the answer. And I don't care if it's finances or marriage problems or whatever we're going through, God, we know you are the answer through Jesus. Thank you. Holy Spirit, remind us this week as we go through our week, Lord God, that Jesus is the answer. Hallelujah. Pray your blessings over each one, Father God. We walk in your spirit. In Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Love you all. Hug a neck. Shake a hand. Tell each other we love each other. Amen. God bless you. It does keep everything in one place. It does, doesn't it? There you go. You've got everything in there. It's got to be. Yeah. There's no like expedition. So yeah, I heard a little bit. Thank you. 
Thank you. 